Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group Weekly Roundup. This is for the trading week ending March 26, 2021. We're coming to the end of Q1. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. This week's theme, as you can see, is half full or half empty. Depends on your point of view, I guess. Let's take a look at how the markets did this past week, right? as everybody probably already knows. Um, but let's just kind of take a swing through it anyway. Um, let's talk about the index performance first. <laughs> you can see that it's kind of a mixed bag. We had uh, the Dow and the S&P in the green, NASDAQ and Russell bringing up the rear, especially the Russell. Uh, year to date, though, the Russell is still leading the way at well, almost 12.5%. The Dow is coming in second. Good, strong, solid, a little over 8%, S&P over almost 6 NASDAQ just broke bread above the zero line. It's up 1.94%. You can see the P.E. ratios. Ford P.E. ratio, 22.62. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit more detail on that for our members this Sunday evening and some of the ramifications of that on a go-forward basis. Take a look at the dividend yield. It's 1.48 S&P Treasury end of the week, 10-year interest rate at 1.66. So the spread's about 18 basis points right now. Um, still, uh, with the higher money into Treasuries, it's going to start competing with the equity markets for money. Current VIX actually down for the week. Um, came down to 9.98%. Finish the week at 18.86. So this is one of those rare instances where we're now below 20. We've stayed above 20 for the longest period of time. We would come in below 20, but then within a day or so, we'd come right back up. So I want to see if we can hold that level or even go lower for this next week. As a reminder, next week, it's going to be a holiday week for the United States markets and other markets as well. As Friday is our good Friday week for Easter weekend, I guess. So all markets in the U.S. are going to be closed on Friday. So it'll be a short trading week for the week. Now, if we take a look at just kind of focusing just a little bit on some of the economic data for the week, we did see several uh, downward surprises in some of the economic data. I mean, we did see existing home sales fall in a little over six and a half percent, which was twice the expectation level. New home sales also tumbled a whopping 18 percent nearly triple what the consensus estimate was. We're also seeing poor weather and supply chain issues taking a toll on business and uh, investment. Non-defense durable goods orders uh, falling about 80 basis points in the month of February. That's eight tenths of a percent. We did see the University of Michigan um, revise uh, its consumer sentiment a little bit higher, but we did see weekly jobless claims fell much more than expected. Also, it reached a new pandemic era low of 684,000. Finally, on the inflation front, perhaps at the top of the list of everybody's investor concerns now, which kind of replaced COVID-19, um, it remains muted. The core inflation, which when you hear core, it just means let's just take food and energy out. But those are two of the most expensive items consumers have. I don't know why they, well, I do know why they take it out of the data. They want to keep inflation artificially low. But they're saying core personal consumption expenditures increased 1.4% year over year, down from 1.5% in January, well below the Fed's 2% target. So understand, by taking out food and energy, i.e. gasoline, which has gone up 30% over the past six months, I mean, you know, what le what's, what's left, right? <clears throat> food and energy, food and gas is where a lot of people spend money on. But anyway, if we just look at that, it's down just a little bit. So boy, oh boy. We also saw this past week our illustrious Fed chair, Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, and our Treasury Secretary, Janet Aunt B. Yellen, testified before Congress. So, of course, they saw a little danger of an overheating economy. But I will remind you that Bernanke, right before 2008 crash, saw little issues as well as early as January of 2008, he didn't see any issue with the markets. <laughs> and next thing you know, we had a crash. So you just keep that in mind, right? Um, we also, if we take a look at the treasury yields, all right, US Treasury, the uh, 10 year, actually, as I said earlier, it came down just a little bit for the week, right? Um, and <clears throat> somewhat, uh, we did see some strong overnight buying, as I said last weekend from Asia. 
you know, and Asian markets are coming in. They're only, not only buying our treasury, but they're invi- buying our investment grade corporate bonds as well. Credit spreads are fairly tight in the bond market. So we're watching that, especially in the corporate bond market. Market because when the markets start to get ugly, that's generally where it starts, all right, in corporate bonds, and then it spreads out from corporate bonds into treasuries, and then it starts affecting equity markets. And by then, currencies are also affected as well. Uh, so <clears throat> that's some of the things that we're seeing there. Now, if we switch over to Europe, let's take a look at European markets. You can see here there's a mixed bag uh, in Europe. We did see the um, uh, euro stocks which is 50 of the largest companies in Europe, up uh, 77 basis points. Year to date, it's really strong. It's it's outperforming everybody but the Russell, right? But that's the 50 largest companies in Europe. The FTSE, which is the London markets, is up almost 50 basis points, half a percent. Year to date, it's up 4.34. Now, you did see uh, France underwater slightly for the week, but, you know, essential purposes is flat. So, Year to date, all the markets from um, Europe, FTSE, CAC 40, DAX, all in the red or in the green, sorry, year to date. The NIC guy had a really ugly week last week, but it's still up 6.31% for the year. That's the Tokyo uh, Japanese market. China, finally, the first up week in like five weeks. Okay. China is up also. Hang Sen was down, but still up year to date. But China is the only market now, if you look at it. That's up year to or down year to date. Chinese markets are not having a very good row of it. And if you go back to Europe, um, they had really strong bullish activity in their PMI data. All right. Their PMI data came in across Europe at 52.5. Keep in mind, everything over 50 is an expansion below 50 is contraction. That's the highest level we've seen in the in the PMI data since 2018. All right. February, it was at 48.8. So that's a really good thing about Europe. But they're having issues with um, locking things down. They're still locking things down. I think a hard nuts Merkel, that's Angela hard nuts Merkel, uh, is coming out now trying to say we don't want to, we want to get things back open again. Well, no shit, Angela. Um, same thing across all the other countries. They locked down Paris and a few others, but I think they're going to slowly start to open them back up which is what they need. And then what I think you're going to see is a pretty good bounce in Europe relative to the U.S., right? I think you're going to see a a pretty good bounce. So that's that's, um, one of the things that I think will be uh, 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 on everybody's playlist. At least macro funds are going to be putting a lot of money back into uh, the European markets, right? So that'll be a pretty cool thing. Okay. So these are just some of the things that that I'm seeing across the the markets right now. I'm going to just switch you over. Let's take you to the S&P 500 E-mini futures. So let me just move you over to a screen here. Um, all right, here we go. So the screen's going to go dark for a second, and then it's going to come back up. It's going to show you a four-hour chart of the um, uh, E-mini S&P 500 futures. Uh, and I like four hours because four hours essentially gives you a – almost like looking at an engine through um, a glass, right? It gives you a little bit more of a detailed view in daily, but it's really close to a daily time frame, right? So it's, it's, it's a pretty good view. So now if we look at this chart here, you can see that huge move we had um, uh, in, and this is a four hour chart, that one four hour bar, we literally moved uh, from about 39.23 all the way up to 39.63. All right, so about 40 points in a four-hour period. And it was actually quicker than that. We moved almost all of those points in the last hour and a half. Because what had happened is the markets had been selling off the entire week in the last couple hours, right? Starting really at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Markets closed at 4 Eastern Standard Time. And the and obviously the futures that we're looking at, you know, trades a little bit longer duration, but uh, or time frame. But... I think what had happened was the market makers just took it to the shorts. You probably saw shorts loading up ready for another downfall, and they just ran the table. And we just had this blow-off move here. Now, you can see my target. I'm still on my target of around 4,000, maybe 4,010. That target level has not changed. Now, I said that we were going to come down. I did not know the depth of the uh, move lower. You can see the Elliott wave count here, 3, 4, and then a 5 leg up here around 
40, 10, 4,010, 4,000, somewhere on that level there. Uh, but it's still very choppy. I mean, we're just getting chopped like crazy. But really going back to um, early in the morning on the 25th, right, that would be on Thursday, we started to make the move and then we just kept going and moving, right? And we actually hit a low just slightly below this FIB level here. Now, for our members, I'm going to go through the significance of Fibonacci levels um, in our Sunday night session um, and, and review a couple of other extra things. And you've got to get these pivot points right. Otherwise, your FIB nodes are just not going to make any sense at all. So you can see how we're moving here. Really nice, strong level. I do believe we're going to move up here. Um, and now, if you guys are following me on these weekly roundups, you recall that in um, – Late Q4 of last year or early this year, I called for a 10% pullback in the markets in Q1. Um, and <clears throat> the NASDAQ, we had about 12% pullback. I think in the S&P, we had a little over 6%, right? Um, and that was it. We just got so much momentum in the market, a lot of money in the markets. Also, uh, members, I'm going to cover a little bit more detail like I did last Sunday, inflation and and. I would agree with the feds on the near term basis. I know everybody wants to say inflation is going to scream higher and I believe it will. And I believe there'll be an opportunity for us to make a really good play to the downside. We're going to have another scare. I think this year, probably as we get through the summer months, uh, July, August timeframe, I think we can um, uh, have a, a little bit of a bigger pullback in the S and P than we had in Q1, which was about 6%. I'm looking for maybe a 15% pullback. And then we're going to finish the year strong. I'm still looking at the year finishing around 4,100, uh, maybe f up to 4,300 tops, but that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Um, and we're going to watch and check the breadth charts very carefully, as well as the credit spreads in the, in the bond market, especially the corporate markets between investment grade and junk to see what, you know, how things are looking. But this is what we're seeing so far. Now I'm going to just take you over and show you another screen. Let me just switch it real quick. Uh, let's come over here and let's look at another view, but I'm going to take you over to the Russell. Okay. And what you're going to see in the Russell is the markets a lot further away from the all time highs. Okay. You can see here in the Russell, we made all time highs on the 15th of March and literally half the month, we pulled back a pretty good bit. Now we're bouncing. We finally regrouped and got back above our 50 EMA again. We came down and pretty much tested this prior pivot low. Uh, on a MACD, should it cross back up again, it would not be a bullish or bearish divergence. Um, but I want to see us clear this 50 EMA. And if we test it again, so be it. But I want to see us get up and clear it. Uh, we're just slightly above this natural pivot point, which also happens to be where the 50 EMA is sitting right now at 2192. So call it 2200. All right. But you can see we're off here pretty good little bit but we're still leading the pack being above the 2020 closing price because we've had such a huge run since November we were actually in the red year to date going into the November time frame in Q4 of last year with with the Russell and it made its entire year in six weeks so we've had a huge catch up and if we look at the Dow futures <clears throat> let me just find them on here you can see here the Dow also had a very strong week like the S&P, moved up very close to its all-time high, okay? Uh, and the Dow is the strongest right now of all of our indexes here in the U.S. If you guys remember last Sunday, I said we do not have a diversion, so any dip here is going to be bought. And I know some of our members were playing the Dow Long, Diamonds, DIA, uh, the ETF. It was just a really good play, right? Um, and some of our other members are playing uh, the Qs, but let's look at it via NASDAQ uh, futures. So if we look at, uh, let me just find it on here, uh, NASDAQ futures. It had a strong day on Friday too, but notice the, let me just get this out of here so you can maybe see it a little bit better. Let me just move it over like this. You can see the 2020 closing price. We've been in the red on the NASDAQ futures. Now this is NASDAQ 100, so it's 100 largest countries companies in NASDAQ. You can see we're just barely clearing the closing price. So we moved back into the green on Friday for NASDAQ. As you saw, I said, I think the year-to-date uh, number on NASDAQ is about 1.94%. Uh, 
uh, but that would be the comp, that would be the cash index. These are the 100 futures. We're still below the 50 EMA, which is this red line. So we are still weak here. And I think NASDAQ is going to underperform as long as we're seeing a rising interest rate environment. Remember, NASDAQ and some of the technology stocks have extremely elevated PE ratios, right? Uh, and members, again, I'll go into more detail Sunday evening on some of the stocks and where I think things can move to. Uh, but you can see here where we are. Now, if I go to the composite index, okay, notice on the composite index, we're also um, above the uh, closing price of 2020. So we're in the green, but we're also below the 50 EMA. So both indexes are weak, okay, very weak. And we're subject to another move back lower. So we got to see both of them are in an ABC uh, Elliott Wave pattern here. Um, and that's after a traditional Elliott Wave 5 um, uh, back over here. That was the the um, all-time highs that we made in the NASDAQ composite was back in the middle of February. So it was over a month and a half ago, right? And then we just, we did not take out this prior pivot high here, which is sitting at 13,607. That's a key level. We came right up, kissed it, and we bounced off of it. So I think we got to challenge it and take it out for it to have any meaning. And if we look at the NASDAQ 100, you can see here we're nowhere near close to the prior pivot high. It's weaker, uh, and we're seeing some weakness in some of these large tech shares that just have huge P.E. ratios. Now, keep in mind, once we get through March, I think April is going to calm down a little bit more. I think we'll see volatility come in just a little bit more. But we're also going to see um, <clears throat> earnings kicking off in about another two weeks. And I just feel sorry for any tech company that's got a high P.E. ratio that doesn't blow out earnings. Now, FactSet, which tracks earnings very closely every quarter, came out and said over 80 some odd percent, uh, 85, 86 percent of companies have revised their growth estimates for Q1 to the upside. That's a record. OK, so that's a good sign. And if you think about it, year over year comps are going to be fairly easy because Q1 earnings um, in 2021, we're going to be comparing them to Q1 earnings in 2020. And even though the pandemic didn't really start taking effect until the beginning of March, you know, it still affected about half that quarter's earnings, right? The market started to pull back about the third week of February. So you can just consider half that quarter's earnings were shot. So Q1 earnings this year and Q2 earnings this year are going to be enormously just blow out the numbers. But they better have a blowout because that's what the markets are pricing in. And if we don't hit those blowout numbers, then you're going to see markets pull back a pretty good bit. It's going to be selective. Those tech companies that don't hit their blowout earnings to sustain those high PEs are going to get whacked. Those that do, then they'll move up. Okay. So that's kind of what we have to look forward to in the coming weeks. And then, as I said, with volatility, if we look at VIX right here, you can see we're now we're breaking that level, right? We're down around the levels that we were just touching on earlier in the week, right around 19, right? And if I just zoom out, you can see here where we held this level for quite some time, right around the 20 level. Every time we come down, we'd bounce off of it, we'd move up. Now we're finally now egging our way down into these lower levels here, okay? We still have a long way to go. Uh, a couple of decade averages around um, 16 down in this area here for a number of years, 2017, particularly we averaged like 10 in the VIX. So we're almost double here, uh, but we're still elevated compared to recent terms, right? And you can see there's no divergence in the MACD. So that doesn't suggest bullish or bearish. It just shows what it is, right? There is no uh, movement. I think the risk of a bigger move, however, is going to be to the upside in the volatility, which means downside in equity. So you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. And then, of course, if we look at the bond market, interest rates did move up pretty strong uh, on Friday. And as I said, you don't want to chase the bond market. Over here, we were shorting the bonds. And I told people that missed the trade, every time it comes up and kisses the red line, which is the 50 EMA, pick up some puts in TLT. And I've had a couple of members that just every time it pick up one put. And if you've noticed, it hit it like 10 times and coming close. And so he was fully engaged by the time it fell off the table and he made a killing just picking up puts in TLT. Now, I'm not chasing this down here. I think we can run around and chop 
Um, but longer term, bonds are going lower. So if you want to trade longer term, TLT to the downside makes sense to me. Short term, we can actually see a run back up to the 50 EMA because we're starting to spread out the 50 and the 200. And typically, like Bollinger Bands, when you get too far away from a moving average, especially the 50, either below or above, it tends to come back and kiss it before it says bye-bye again. So <clears throat> we're going to kind of see which way it goes, but um, I'm expecting it to run sideways a little bit before um, maybe chop a little bit. The trade was back over here in um, December of last year. All right. That was the, the low hanging fruit trade, as I like to call it. If we look at interest rates, you can see that the 10 year um, is off of their highs of 175. Right. But you can see the MACD right here. There is really no divergence in this MACD from this high pivot to this high pivot. A lot of volume and buying in here. So that does suggest that any pullback here is going to be bought interest rate wise. So you could trade it with TBT. Keep in mind, guys, that if you trade TBT, it's like a 2x. Uh, um, it's an accelerated uh, amplified um, ETF. Anytime you trade any 2 or 3x, do not trade it more than four to six weeks tops because they typically have a negative roll yield the way they manage those things. And you're just going to get, you're not going to make the same thing as the asset. The best way to trade it is trade bond futures, right? I mean, that's an easy way to trade it. Or you can trade Euro dollars. Those are another way to trade. Um, but that's kind of what we're looking at on treasuries, treasuries. And if we come over and look at the U S dollar, let me find it here. An interesting thing about the dollar notice, even though interest rates goes up, the dollar, in that particular instance went down but the dollar is up off these lows here we've regained the 50 ema and we're testing the 200 and a little bit of a pullback it may move up back to the 93 94 area in fact if you look at the elliott wave count it's suggesting it can move all the way back up to 95 95 5 right keep in mind that a stronger dollar kind of suppresses inflation and this goes along with what boom boom powell and Aunt B is saying uh, about inflation. I do believe, or it depends on how long you define the word transitory. It could be one day if you're a day trader. It could be a month, uh, two or three weeks if you're a swing trader, or it could be 90 days to six months if you're a longer term position hold. Um, I think Boom Boom Powell is defining transitory as a year or two because they don't have any rate hikes on their dot plot until 2023. All right, and then they got three. I think that's going to be moved up to the middle to end of 2022. And then 22, 23 is when we're going to start to have big issues with the market. And I don't mean a correction of 10 to 15%. I'm talking about a bear market, all right? 2022, 2023 is when it's going to get ugly. So right now, take advantage of any dip, even if it's going to be 10 to 15%, which I think the odds are going to be good for that as we get through the middle to end of the summer months of this year. But I still believe we're going to be running up. Okay. The U.S. dollar, though, as long as it stays strong, inflation is going to be weak. When the dollar sells off, interest rates are going to go um, higher and it's going to bring in more inflationary tendencies. Okay. Um, the euro, if we look at the euro, longer term, guys, um, and that would be more than six months, uh, I am bullish the euro. Um, if we come and look at the euro currencies, you can see here. We're testing the 200 EMA. Much like the dollar, the euro goes the opposite direction. Actually, the euro, the yen and the pound account for about 90% of the dollar index. Okay? The euro alone accounts for about 58% of the dollar index. So you can see here, this move lower down this area here. If it gets much lower, going along the euro to me makes sense. Right? I just don't see the dollar getting too elevated. Uh, but as long as inflation is benign and inflationary uh, uh, numbers are benign, the dollar is going to just drift to move higher with the euro. Now, remember, the euro is selling off because they've shut everything down there. They've had a they've had a double dip recession. Uh, they shut down the economy. They're more socialist over there. So they just they don't give a shit about business. They're shutting stuff down. Um, and some countries are better than others, obviously. But when you just consolidate all of them they're a mess they don't perform like the u.s does i mean over in europe the largest companies are like chocolate nestle and louis vuitton selling handbags that's the companies in europe the companies in the u.s they're more into cloud computing internet 
social media, uh, uh, smartphones. That's where the money is. That's, you know, lifestyle stuff. Over in Europe, they're still stuck in the old days. And a lot of it's because of the way they run their government and the way they run their economy. You don't have the, the big um, opportunities there that you do in the U.S. That's why a lot of companies still come to the United States and a lot of entrepreneurs love the U.S. Hopefully it's not screwed up with the political idiots and the idiocracy we're seeing right now, but we'll see. But long story short, the euro, once they get those uh, companies open back up and the economy gets back on track again, it's going to look like this side of the chart. It's going to come back up. It's going to test this. In fact, one of my targets is up here around 125, 126, but that probably won't be until we get into summer, the end of this year, and then we'll see this thing start to move higher. So remember, I'll review with you some good times to take a look at it. If we look at gold, gold, just because it's been so ugly, Remember when it down, when it was down here, guys, I said, go long gold, at least up to this level up here. And some of our members took the trade. You've made some money. It's about $100 a point or so. Um, so you can make some good money with gold uh, moving up. <clears throat> We're in this consolidation pattern here. I think longer term gold will move up, but not this year. All right, not this year. Same thing with silver. In fact, I tell people, uh, if you're going to be long a security, you want to be long silver over gold. Although silver, you know, it is, it's got, it's beyond its, its down sloping trend line, but we're running sideways right now in silver, as you can see. Um, longer term, I think it's going to be bullish, but short term, is, to me, it's just dead money, right? Those are the two that, now, the other one, copper. Copper is really interesting. As you guys know, and this is one of the trades I put out here on our, our free weekly roundup. Back over here, I had 10 trades that I posted, every single one of them. Of course, you could have thrown a dart at a stock paper report and picked that stock and been good if you'd gone in here. So I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but there were the ones that I picked were the ones that were going to move the biggest. Copper was one of them, you know, and it was like a 5X trade. Getting long back here, you can go on copper futures or you could have just done the stock and it just took off. Okay. Now it's in this consolidation mode here, almost like a symmetrical triangle. And I think if it breaks out, it's going to run again. And I believe that will happen. You can watch the MACD. If we get across above the zero line, it'll come up and it'll test this recent high right here um, and probably move up to a level that I see more appropriate around four, five, seven to, to five, oh, okay. As we move through the summer months. So let's see where it goes. OK, um, and we've got good profits in it. We got out of the trade right over here with this big. It, it kind of got ahead of itself when the when it accelerated up here starting in uh, early February. And then it's pulled back and it's just digesting right now. It's kind of going nowhere, just digesting itself. Right. So that's a little bit about what we're seeing there. And of course, if we come over to energy, if we look at oil, very strong Friday. It was up a couple of points. But they got problems with the Suez Canal. A little fishing boat got stuck in the middle. <laughs> actually, it's one of the biggest oil ships in the world. Tanker actually blocked the entire Suez Canal. It's going to take them a while to dig out. And if it takes them longer than, at first they thought it'd be a couple of days. Now they're saying maybe a couple of weeks. It's going to screw up the supply chain. It's already screwed up to begin with, right? So ships are going to be diverting and going around um, um, South America and other areas because so as, I can't believe they didn't have backups to that. I'm sure they're going to work on it now. Um, but anyway, you can see oil. As I said, and I, and I think I may have put this out there to you guys as well. I said, fade this move. It's going to pull back. Now, obviously, the Suez Canal sped the, the, the move lower. But I just I saw 67.98 too high right now. I think eventually we'll come back up and challenge that number again. But for now, it's going to be choppy. You know, iron condors with calls make sense to me because uh, it's easy to adjust. A, I'm sorry, not an iron condor, just a condor using all calls uh, makes sense to me in the um, oil market or um, unbalanced flies. Uh, you can do well in oil by doing that. Right? I don't think that I think the downside is probably not going to go below uh, this 55 level. It's it was dancing around the 50 EMA, came down, kissed it a couple of times and now it's moving back up. Uh, Nat gas. Well, I was hoping for Nat gas to go higher. Right in this area here, I said you got to fade this move as well. When we were fading oil, it was fading Nat gas as well. You can see it's dancing around the uh, 200 EMA. 
Um, I think eventually it's going to come down and test at 2.26 again. Anytime that gas gets over three, sell it, right? It just It's going to be a higher profile trade. All right, everybody, that's a little bit about where we are right now. I'm going to come out with a series of um, videos for you guys uh, on YouTube. Uh, I think anywhere from seven to ten of the top options trading strategies and just a couple of key tips on each one of them so i hope you guys will enjoy them um should be a lot of fun for you and again if you're not in our group i highly encourage you to come in because we're using option strategies on everything uh, commodities in particular um, certain assets as well as the spx and the way we're running the flies <clears throat> you got to jump in on that because you know if you've got an account that's using um uh, reg t account uh i can show you how you can very safely make 20, 25% a year. And if you want to just add the risk a little bit, make about 40 to 60% returns on your account. Um, and if you've got portfolio margin, you can do better, but you have to understand portfolio margin and understand how to hedge those trades, uh, those flies, because it's completely different the way we do them. All right, everybody, that's kind of where we're sitting right now. I will see members. I will see you this Sunday evening. Everybody else have a great weekend. Take care, folks. Shout out.